Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So I've done six years of optimized character builds on this channel, and I've already done tier ranks for all my builds from 2018 through the end of 2021. Links to those videos are in the video description if you wanted to check them out. Basically, with a new player's handbook coming out in November, this seems like a good time to revisit all the builds I've made with the 2014 rules and review them based on how popular they were with my viewers and how good I think they were compared to each other. As you can see, S to D ranks for all the builds based on those factors, and the yellow border for these builds indicate they are the most recent. And if you wondered if the different colored borders were a help with the visuals on a fourth and final video, which would include a final tally and overview, well, give yourself a pat on the back. That's exactly why. And if you want to revisit any of the builds that I go over in this video, I have created a playlist for them that I will include in the video description. So I'm going to be covering 27 builds in this video. There are 20 from 2022 and 5 more from 2023. So I was covering all the playtest material and that really slowed down my character builds last year. I expect that to change dramatically in 2025. So let's start on January 17th, 2022 and my Sorlock guide updated. My first Sorlock build was back in 2019. And the question that kept coming up with all the new subclasses and feats and spells and racial customization options in Tasha's, how would that change how I would build a Sorlock? And first and foremost, switching the Sorcerer subclass from Divine Soul to Clockwork was going to have a dramatic impact on the spell versatility of the build, particularly battlefield control options to block enemy movement. So the character name, the Clock Blocker, just seemed like a gift from the heavens. Tasha's really did impact the build with feats like Fate Touched, and then there's Monsters of the Multiverse and the Heron Gone Race for a big initiative boost. Spells like Tasha's Mind Whip and Summon Draconic Spirit from Fizzbins round out the spell selections, and yeah, I think my first Sorlock build still works fine, but there's no question in my mind the updated Sorlock ups the ante. And views are really strong here at over 117,000, and this is an easy, easy S tier for the updated Sorlock, and if you want an optimized Sorlock build, I would definitely recommend this one over my previous version. Then on January 28th, 2022, I released the Tear and Scare. So the Tear and Scare is based on an interaction I noticed between Extra Attack, the new Dragonborn variants from Fizzbins, and the Extra Attack feature of Bladesinger Wizards. Okay, so Bladesinger gets that special Extra Attack where they can replace one of the attacks with the casting of a cantrip, and I wondered if there was a good interaction for making Eldritch Blast that cantrip. So then you'd be combining extra attack with the extra attacks that are built into the Eldritch Blast cantrip, along with Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast, of course. The main roadblock on that concept is that essentially you're just adding a single weapon attack onto Eldritch Blast, and it requires a pretty substantial investment into Wizard and Bladesinger to get it. And there's no way to focus on both Charisma and Intelligence, so it's just not worth it. But then I noticed that the Dragonborn and Fizzbins could replace an attack from Extra Attack with their Breath Weapon, but I still wasn't sure that was worth the multiclass. But then I found the key to make it work. In Xanathar's, they had racial feats, including Dragon Fear, which replaces the one full action Dragonborn Breath Weapon with a Mass Fear effect. But the new Dragonborn can replace it with a single weapon attack from Extra Attack. And that's the concept of the Terran Scare. So you take the attack action, and you make no weapon attacks. You replace the first attack with Eldritch Blast, you knock your enemies away, and then replace the second attack with Dragon Fear, sticking your enemies at range. It's probably the strongest attack action I've been able to compile for an optimized build, and there's a few fighter levels on there as well, to allow you to do it all over again in the same round, or maybe punish an enemy even further with a Grasping Arrow from Arcane Archer. This is a very strong build, but it didn't get the traction at 32,797 views. I don't know, maybe the name wasn't catchy enough, but that many views would normally land this in C tier. But you know what? It's a really strong interaction, and I'm going to bump this one up to B tier. But I got wiser with my next video on February 11th, 2022, and I just titled the video The Blade Singer Build Guide. Ka-ching! 141,000 plus views. Just need that magic word, Bladesinger. And no multiclassing, this is a straight wizard build, but not so much a straightforward build because I do a lot of math and DPR calculations in this one, showing how Shadow Blade is effective at some levels, but not so much at others, and how you can build a Bladesinger as a melee character, 
but be a lot more effective than just using Shadow Blade or Tensor's Transformation by using different spells to enhance her combat ability. The character name is sort of complicated because the tactics this character uses for spellcasting and being a melee combatant change as it goes up in level rather than just, okay, we cast Shadow Blade with a higher level slot now. There was a lot of work punching math with this one and looking at different ways to make Bladesinger still fill the concept without the same old spells all the time. So I think it deserved to be a higher viewed video and this is going to be the most viewed build on our list today, S tier. So that brings us to February 14th, 2022, and for Valentine's Day, a love letter to the Rogue class. So when you're active in the optimization community, you are expected to just accept certain things as true. Like, wizards are the most powerful class in the game, and rogues, well, they're better than monks, and maybe better than barbarians, but that's debatable. I tend not to be one of those members of the community. I want our preconceived notions to be tested and debated and challenged. I love to be wrong because when I find out I'm wrong, I just became better at what I do because I actually learn something. Well, a friend of mine who goes by Ramen Goblin online showed me how the community was wrong on that one with his straight class rogue build, the Double Phantom. After he demonstrated it in a one shot that I ran, I approached him right away about doing a video for the build and he wrote up such a good explanation, the video is mostly just me reading off what he wrote. I've often seen this build getting referenced on Reddit or other YouTube channels, and I tend to be giving credit for it, so I'm just going to say it again. This isn't my build. The double phantom really isn't all that complicated. Raman just recognized the inherent strength of the phantom rogue subclass and made careful optimization decisions to make the most out of every feature of both the subclass and the base rogue class. The only real combination you might not intuit is taking the Ritual Caster feat to be able to cast Phantom Steed so you can be a mounted rogue that can use steady aim while your mount moves you around at high speeds. And I want to stress that the optimization decisions were careful because our instincts sometimes lead us in the wrong direction. Don't we want the archery combat style? No, we don't because it's not worth the investment if you do the math. You're already hitting 99% of the time you just don't need the plus two. And at over 125,000 views, the Double Phantom didn't just perform well. I think it did change how a lot of the community view those supposed absolutes we are supposed to just accept, which I think is the best result this video possibly could have had. S tier, big capital S. And yeah, we're starting this video with a lot of high tier builds, but by the time we're done, we will fill in those bottom ranks. But not yet. As my next video on February 25th, 2022 was my how to build a sword in video, which was an update to my previous Sorcerer Paladin build that I called the Spell Sword back in 2019. So I remember back before I started this channel and participated in the Wizards forums back when they existed, we used to call the Sorcerer Paladin multiclass a sword in. I was informed after this video that the community generally calls this combination the sword in these days. So I kind of felt like an old man. I guess I am an old man, but I usually don't feel like one. But here I am saying, ah, back in my day, they were called Soradins. Now leave me alone. I'm printing my email so I can read them while listening to my 80s mixtape. Anyways, the build was based on an analysis of that multi-class combination that I had recently released, where I focused on the three best ways to utilize that combination, support, spellcasting, and weapon capability. So I called the build the three-way. One standard convention I challenged in the video was the ever-popular Hexblade dip and why I thought the build was more effective without it. Views are very good at over 95,000, normally enough for S tier, but I'm going to knock this one down to A tier. I think it's a solid enough build, but I'm not sure I really brought enough new ideas to justify S. It probably is an improvement over my initial spell sword. But when I look at the other five builds here, this one is the one that excites me the least. Okay, March 28th, 2022, my Barbarian build guide for the Zealot subclass, character name, Drop Dead Fred. I think Colby recently did a Drop Dead Fred build, but very, very different concept. The point of this video was mainly built around one thing. Conventional wisdom is Barbarians can be effective with some multiclassing. But in general, you don't want to be taking Barbarian into double digit levels. Want to show there is one exception to this guideline, 
and that's the 14th level Zealot subclass feature, Rage Beyond Death, which, in my opinion, is far and away the most powerful feature a Barbarian can get. Not a cheap investment, of course. I mean, 14 levels. And if you aren't going to 14th level, then there's no real point. But Rage Beyond Death is a feature like no other that allows your character to die, kind of. I mean, you hit zero hit points and you fail all the death saves, yet you stay upright and keep fighting at full force, immune to all damage, until your rage ends. And as long as you recover one single hit point before that happens, death averted. It's a play experience that no other subclass or class can provide, and it's pretty damn fun. At 43,000 plus views, that's B territory for Drop Dead Fred, and you know what? That's about where I think it should be. I wanted to highlight a feature that's fun, and we often don't see, and if you haven't had a chance to try it, you might want to soon, because it looks like the designers aren't going to keep the whole immunity to death thing with this subclass in the next player's handbook. Okay, so on to April 11th, 2022, and get on up. So I want to find a way to optimize the Minotaur race, because when I think about big brooding races, the Minotaur is the first one that comes to mind thematically, but not necessarily mechanically. So I built around the Hammering Horns feature that allows the Minotaur to push an enemy up to 10 feet after hitting them with a melee attack. So the combination here actually works for all kinds of things, like give the Dao Warlock the Crusher Feet and Repelling Blast, and they can do a similar kind of thing. But basically, Crusher allows you to move the creature you just hit by 5 feet in any direction, not just horizontal. So if you're next to a creature, and then you move them 5 feet up into the air, and then you have a simultaneous effect that pushes them directly away from you, it then pushes them diagonally upwards, at which point they will fall, become prone, and take falling damage. In this video, I go over the simultaneous effects rules in Xanathars, which allow the player to choose the order the force movements occur, which allows the combination to work. I think the interaction of combining force movements to throw things into the air is pretty cool, though admittedly I'm not sure Minotaur is the best way to achieve the combo, but with over 47,000 views, this should land in B tier, and that's exactly where it's going to fall. If you do want to play a Minotaur and be a big, brutish character, I think this is about as good as I could come up with. Okay, so on to April 18th, 2022, and the Swords Bard, the ultimate longsword build. So ignoring game mechanics for a bit, my favorite weapon is a sword. Not a massive Zweihander, Zweihander, however it's pronounced, or anything like that, but the kind of sword that in D&D is mechanically represented by the longsword. The problem with longswords is there's just not a lot of feet or feature support for that particular weapon. Though, if you want a magic weapon, magic long swords are probably the most common in the game. So I worked a bit at finding the best build for this particular weapon, and that was a swords bard with a hex blade dip. The dungeon dudes have put out a video covering just such a build, but I thought I could add some detail and maybe make a few optimization adjustments to refine the build, and the hex bard build is what I came up with. At over 98,000 views, this build was popular with viewers, and it's got another 400 views or so since I first planned this video. So it's going to pass 100,000 views soon enough. So this one is S tier. Not sure it's the absolute strongest Swords build possible, but it is about the strongest Swords Bard build that swings the longsword. Okay, so back to challenging conventional wisdom in the optimization community. The most powerful Bard is the Eloquence Bard. Well, a friend of mine named Justin disagreed and was convinced the actual most powerful Bard was the Creation Bard, and he convinced me. And so I decided to show why the Creation Bard was the most powerful subclass, with the most powerful Bard in D&D is a Disney Princess. Poka Snowbell was the build I came up with to highlight the power of the Creation Bard. And yeah, ask me today what the most powerful Bard subclass is, and I'll answer Creation. There was a lot of possibilities with the subclass I just hadn't considered until Justin opened up my eyes and I go through them in the video with this one possible build to take advantage of them. Views are good, over 62,000, enough for A tier, and I have no arguments at all with that. Okay, May 6th, 2022, and my monk puts on full plate. Character name, Armored Monk. Should have put more thought into that. Okay, so this build was the result of a deep dive into monk features and discovering that almost none 
of the monk features, or the features of monk subclasses, prohibit wearing armor. I think we read the martial arts feature at level 1 that has this prohibition and come to the conclusion, okay, I guess no armor, and then we read the rest of the class assuming no armor. So I wondered, what if we just ignored that one feature and we put on armor anyways? Of course, we need armor proficiency, so we'll need a multi-class, and while I'm at it, do we even need to use a monk weapon? Maybe not. Again, we can do our stuff for the most part with any weapon. So I started working on a build. And here's the thing. Monks aren't very good. And putting armor on them doesn't really change that. Sure, we can do flurry of blows and stunning strikes while wearing full plate armor and wielding a maul. And you can look it up. But that doesn't necessarily make for an optimized build. I ended up deciding to make a video for it anyways because, you know what, I figured it was a good enough thought experiment and I learned a lot in the process. And I figured maybe I shouldn't shy away from videos going over my failures because the viewers might learn along with me. And the response was pretty good for my first video about an admitted failure. Over 56,000 views, which is enough to land the Armored Monk in B tier. Of course, it's gotta go in D tier. If you wanna learn more about Armor Prohibition and the Monk, I think this is a good informative video, but the build is a failure, even if the video wasn't. Okay, so on to May 27th, 2022, in my healer build, Wild Magic and Fiend Patron. Character name, the overly attached girl fiend, because if nothing else, I'm cutting edge on the newest memes. Okay, so the reference in this build was so outdated that most of my viewers didn't even recognize it. But the build combines Fiend Patron Warlock and Wild Magic Sorcerer and a Life Cleric Dip to heal 40d6 plus 100 hit points with a single casting of a third level spell. It also has lots of fireballs and Eldritch Blasts to throw in combat. This build did require a Strixhaven background to select Aura Vitality as a third level spell, and I normally try to avoid setting specific material, but I mean I needed it to make the build work. Viewers are lower on this one, bit over 29,000, and that's enough for C tier. And yeah, I'm good with C tier. The Aura of Vitality combination is really good, and I played this build a couple times, and it was fun, but mostly funny fun, not super powerful fun. Okay, so June 3rd, 2022, build video number 69, dude, and optimizing the new bugbear. So when Monsters of the Multiverse came out, everyone was drooling over the new bugbear, which had a huge power boost over the legacy version. So by the time I made this build, there were already lots of Gloomstalker, Assassin, Action Surge, Bugbear builds being thrown around, and I just didn't really want to copy the crowd. Though that combination is really good with Bugbear, but I decided to go a different route and decided on a Scorching Ray build with the Action Surge because upcasting Scorching Ray totally works with Surprise Attack, and that kind of build wasn't really being explored. Bugbearing down on my foes uses War Mage, Ambush, and Alert to win initiative, and then use Scorching Ray with lots of rays. The big disadvantage to this build is you really are married to fire damage until later spells like Steel Wind Strike come online. But as long as fire damage works, you can pack a ton of damage into round 1. Pretty good views here, over 52,000, enough for B tier for the Bugbear build, and you know what, I'm good with that. Okay, so July 29th, 2022, and The Grappling Monk. Character name, The Gramunkler. There was a bit of a reshuffling of the build to make it work that I do cover in the video, but the basic idea is, if you watch my last tier rank video, I discussed how the grapple death squad is broken. And this is largely based on how effective grappling and dragging is, especially with spells like spike growth in the game, and that got me thinking, if I want to move as far as possible, monks are fast. Astral monks can make decent grapplers, and then you can multi-class rune knight, they can be great grapplers, so I discuss this in conjunction with the build and discuss why that if you want to make a grappling character, Monk can work. The build does have some weaknesses though, and with modest views at 37,717, I am totally fine with C tier for this one. Okay, so one thing I have learned over the years is how a good build can help views somewhat, but nothing gets you views, like including words like Sorcedin, Sorlock, Bladesinger, or Hexedin in the title of the video. And the last few build videos didn't get as many views, so on August 5th, the Hexedin, and boom, 79,000 views plus. Now if you think, man Chris, you're just playing the YouTube game, 
I mean, for me, YouTube isn't a hobby, it's my full-time job, so sometimes I have to play the game a bit. This is actually an update to my previous build, the Ultimate Jack of All Trades, which I gave C tier in my first tier video due to a lack of views. So I knew the problem. So when I presented my updated version, I titled it the Hexaden and the views more than doubled. It's a better build too, as I had the Watcher's Paladin available and other Tasha stuff. So that's A tier level views. So I think it's worth A tier and it's gonna be the last one in A tier for a while. So on August 12th, I released the Knight in Shining Armor build and I want to make a couple builds that filled the concept of a Knight in Shining Armor in optimized ways. So this build is a Sorcedin, 6 Paladin, 8 Sorcerer, named Surrounded. This is my second land-centered build. The first was the Techno Knight, a Battlesmith Gnome that rides a Steel Defender. This was actually the first one that uses a horse, using the Fine Steed spell. And a big focus of the build was to address the weaknesses of mounted builds. Like, there's places that horses can't go and horses die easily. So this build has some way to actually make the concept work without being the unmounted knight walking through the dungeon while the horse waited tied to the tree outside. Big mistake on this build though. I didn't call it a source it in. So views are moderate at a bit over 33,000, which is enough for C tier, which I'm good with, because horse mounted characters aren't for everyone. But what about a Pegasus mounted character? That's what I did with my next build which is The Flying Knight, released on August 15th, 2022. So if you want fine greater steed with your paladin, you're waiting till very high levels, but The Flying Knight uses magic secrets through Swords Bar to access it a lot earlier than a paladin ever would. A hex tip for a charisma-based lance attack, and you're up and flying. Is there a catchy name for a bard with a hex tip? Is it Hex Bard? I don't know, but The Flying Knight didn't attract as much attention at 26,000 views. And the interesting thing is, this build is extremely close to my Longsword Swords Bard build until level 11. Almost the same. Then you grab a Lance and a Pegasus and the Mountain Combatant feat to convert the Longsword Swords Bard into a Flying Lance Swords Bard. I think it's a good way to steer that build at that level, but I can't give this more than C tier with that many views. And it's kind of interesting to see how two builds that are so similar get such different responses based on concept, thumbnail, and title. I'm thinking in retrospect what I should have done is frame this as a sequel to the Longsword Swords Bard and just discussed how you can use that build up to double digit levels and then here's another option for higher levels. I think that might have done better. Okay, so my next build was the Frostbane Barbarian released on September 26, 2022. So the build name and concept were something I came up way before releasing this video. The idea is you optimize around Armor of Agathis that punishes enemies who attack you with cold damage, and then you pad those temporary hit points from Armor of Agathis with resistance from Barbarian Rage. And maybe you get Fire Shield, which can do cold damage for even more damage to the enemy. It's a little bit like the concept I had for my Abjure build in 2019, but this one gives a lot more incentive for the enemies to attack because this guy is attacking you with Reckless Attack and Divine Smites. I was never satisfied with the build though, until I revisited it later and tried throwing on Clockwork Soul, which padded Armor of Agathis even more with Bastion of Law, so you now have resistance and damage reduction, and I was finally happy enough with the build to present it. And the response wasn't bad. With more than 42,000 views, that's enough for B tier. Okay, so I had just completed a video covering the Invisible Condition on October 24th, including that weird rules interaction where a creature with the invisible condition gets advantage on attacks and disadvantage to be attacked, even if the enemy can see them. So even True Sight and Blind Sight, or astoundingly, the See Invisibility spell, don't remove that bullet point. Along with Jeremy Crawford saying how that's how it works, and it's all intentional. Well, let's just say I'm skeptical. But I figured I should do a build and see what we can achieve, and I released... And what a catchy name this is, Bard Sorcerer Invisible Archery Build. I mean, it's not catchy, but you know what it is. The build is an Elven Accuracy build named Pull Your Elf Together. The build utilizes Quickened Greater Invisibility and Sharpshooter, which shouldn't be a surprise. Lots of comments from viewers on this one that the rules interaction is silly, and they would never allow invisibility to work if the invisible character can be seen. And yeah, it shouldn't work 
and I totally understand DMs who rule otherwise. Views were moderate at a bit over 35,000, which is enough for C tier, and I am good with C tier. Most of my builds work at pretty much any table, and this is one that doesn't. Okay, so my next build was kind of a collaboration. I was contacted by the Twisted Tentacle YouTube channel about a build challenge where we would each make a character based around the concept of a character that is a herbalist who has discovered strange plants and fungi. Okay, so with that, my mind immediately went to a concept that I need to be careful talking about on YouTube, but I figured I know of a strange plant you can smoke, and Cheech and Chong really created a subculture around it, and maybe I could make a character based on Tommy Chong. So I did, and it was an aberrant mind sorcerer because of, you know, mind-altering substances, with a peace cleric dip for the hippie vibe. And I guess I dated myself again, because a lot of my viewers didn't know who Cheech and Chong were. I think maybe I should have had the character be based on Seth Rogen instead. Anyways, views were modest in the mid-30,000 range, and it's more of a fun comedic take on the concept rather than a seriously optimized build. Spells like Stinking Cloud make an appearance for the first time on any of my builds, and yeah, it's C-tier, no argument there. Okay, so on to November 18th, 2022, and the Dread Necromancer, a table-friendly build. So this is really an update to my original Necromancer build, but it's more than just taking more recent powerful options. What I really wanted to do was take a character that's powerful, but it's going to be a pain in the ass to play, and will probably annoy everyone you're playing with, and remake it so that the concept survives, but instead you have powerful options and you don't bog down the game to an unbearable slog. The Dread Necromancer is a character I would actually play in a campaign, without pissing off anyone else at the table. The build uses the Necromancer Undead Thralls feature to buff the more table-friendly Summon Undead spell instead of Animate Dead. Now, there is a rules interaction you do need to ask your DM about, because Summon Undead doesn't say whether you're summoning the undead spirit into existence, or you're transporting an existing spirit from somewhere else. And Undead Thrall says it only works on undead you create. And Jeremy Crawford apparently tweeted it's not even supposed to work with the Create Undead spell, which has Create right in the name. Now, I believe 90% of DMs are going to be fine with this interaction, and the other 10% need a talking to. Though, you should discuss it with them before committing to the character. Otherwise, you'll be commanding Thralls as skeletons, which sounds way cooler than it is. With over 90,000 views, this is S-tier. And I really like this build, so S-tier it remains. The Dread Necromancer was the first in a series of summoning builds. The next was released on November 21st, 2022. The Warlock Summoner. Character name, the Scion of Cthulhu. And yes, I know there's a spelling mistake there. And it combined the Summon Shadow Spawn spell, which has the Despair Spawn that slows enemies by 20 feet, with the Fathomless Tentacle that slows them by another 10 feet. A Sorcerer dip for shield, and you end up with a pretty good damage control build. Views are decent at over 44,000. That's enough for B tier. And I gotta be honest, I don't like this one as much as the Dread Necromancer, and I am good with B tier. Then on December 19th, I released the Sorcerer Aberrant Mind Summoner. So up to this point, the only Aberrant Mind build I have ever released is the Tommy Chong Joke build, so this Kobold Sorcerer, that's a thrall to an Elder Brain Dragon, and optimizes around the Summon Aberration spell, is also largely a guide to the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer, and how to use Psionic Sorcery to juggle spell slots and sorcery points for more flexibility in using spell slots. Draconic Cry is used to provide advantage on the Aberration's attacks, allowing for a significant damage Nova when you want it, and that's not available to the other summoning builds. A pretty solid build, I think, and views are decent at 44,000 plus, good enough for B tier. Okay, so January 13th, 2023, and the Barbarian. Character name, Tenacious T, half Jack Black, and half Mr. T. This is what I called a Franken build, multiclassing two classes that should normally never be mixed. And I did my best to make it work. And, you know, I had a lot of fun with the build and the video. It's a semi-viable build, and if you have a hankering to mix Bard and Barbarian for, you know, some reason, maybe for the catchy name, I think it squeezes as much as possible out of that abomination. And the views? Well, 23,000, one of my lowest, and poor Tenacious T is relegated to D tier. 
Not that I regret the tea. Once every hundred years or so, when the sun doth shine and the moon doth glow, I'll make this kind of video. Okay, I did a whole series of videos talking about Wild Shape, and then I followed them up with two Moon Druid-centric build videos. The first was Moon Druid build The Blazing Inferno on March 27th, 2023. So the thing I like about this particular build is the big play, of course, relies on fire damage and grappling an enemy to its burning death. But unlike my Bugbear Scorching Ray build, you have lots of options if fire isn't the ideal damage type. This was also my first build utilizing the Plasmoid as a race, and I discussed some very weird interactions regarding Plasmoid and Wild Shape. And views are so-so at 36,000 plus. Not for C tier. And you know what? Wild Shape is a bit of a mess. The Moon Druid is a bit of a mess. And so I guess we can call this a hot mess. Honestly, if you want to go Moon Druid and utilize Elemental Wild Shape, I think it's a decent build. And honestly, I was surprised it didn't get more views. Though, a bigger surprise came with the Moon Druid Wild Shape build, the Deathblow Tornado, released on April 3rd, 2023, which was my other Moon Druid Elemental build. So this one was focused more on speed, maneuverability, and big damage hits, rather than the slow burn. I honestly was pretty sure this would outperform the Blazing Inferno, just because the build is a lot more the kind of character that, I guess, I would prefer to play. I like the big movement and big hit style more than lots of little instances of D10s, but the views on this one, blue. It's 22,000 and change, so the Death Blow Tornado should be D tier, but I can't put it at D tier. I think it doesn't deserve that, so I'm going to bump it up to C. If I was to disregard views, probably would have been a B. And on April 14th, 2023, I released the Son of a Beach. So Son of a Beach is my first Swarmkeeper Ranger, multi-class with Cleric and a Sorcerer Dip. So I talked about Force Movement, Order of Operations with my Get On Up Minotaur build. And I mentioned that there's a number of ways to make use of the combination. And Son of a Beach uses Swarmkeeper Swarm Force Movement in combination with the Crusher Feet. So this is a Wisdom-based Ranger that uses Shillelagh. And their Swarm is a like a swarm of sand swirling around them. I kind of had the Spider-Man villain Sandman in my mind, and then they use Spirit Guardians, also swirling sand around them, and they hit an enemy with Shillelagh, they use Swarm Keeper Gathered Swarm to move them out of the Spirit Guardians, and then Crusher Force Movement to move them back into the Spirit Guardians to take the damage on our turn, as well as their own. I mean, that's the combo for the build, and I think it's a decent build, Views were so-so with over 29,000, which is enough for C tier, and I think C tier sounds about right. And we finish up on December 29th, 2023 with my optimized Order of Scribes wizard build, the Nerd of Prey. I'd been asked to do an Order of Scribes build ever since Tasha's came out, as it's the only wizard subclass I didn't have a build for. One of the challenges of doing that is I already had 10 dedicated wizard builds, and I wanted to make sure that a Scribes wizard build didn't just look like any of them, but with Scribes features. In the end, I think I achieved that. Features like damage type switching and manifest mind remote casting do affect your spell selection. And in the end, I think the Nerd of Prey distinguishes itself as a unique play experience. Now, the views. So they aren't as high as my other wizard builds with a bit over 42,000, but... Keep in mind, those builds have had five years of accumulating views. In fact, I had to adjust my script because the video had just over 41,000 views when I was planning this, and that was like a week ago. And it's the only built video to get 1,000 views in the meantime. So it's 42,000 views, which would normally put it in B tier, but I am confident it's going to at least earn an A tier position soon enough, and it definitely deserves it, in my opinion and give it five years, and it might be my highest viewed wizard video, I'm not sure. Though I gotta think all these build videos are not gonna get the same views after the new player's handbook is released, I guess we'll see. But that covers all my builds of 2022 and 2023. There might be more builds before the player's handbook in November, but I'm not really sure at the moment. For now, I'm just gonna say thanks for watching, and until next time, I'm gonna sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks everybody, and I'll talk to you soon. These videos are possible thanks to the patrons of this channel. If you'd be willing to support my work through Patreon, please check the link in the video description. But today, I would like to thank the following patrons. 
Mr. Wonderful, Babrak, Blue Wolf, John D, Discarpus 9, El Conquistadorito, Jared Huberger, John Wayne, Joseph Hall, Joseph Robodeau, Joseph Rogers, Wu Carl Kong, Michael Michelle, Moxie, Nemo, Paul Suzak, Prometheo NTG, Richtenstahl, Rico, Ryan Wilmot, Shane and Todd Beyond, Starfall, Stephen Moline, Earshine, Third, and Wade.